Welcome to the second Dev Talk this year. So this month's Dev Talk, it's my pleasure to introduce the a former production manager from Capcom. And he worked on the Dead Rising series series before he went indie. Recently, uh, when he went indie, he went from Japan to England, and then is currently in Ohio, several hours away from here. And they just recently released their first game, City of the Shroud, which is up on the screen right now. So, yeah, I'll let Mr. Keaton White take over and do his talk. <laughs> cool. cool. Um, um, can we begin? Begin? I, I have never done anything to work on this before, so hopefully this, this is working. working. I... Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Cool. It's got both of you. It's got through a break. Awesome. Alright, in that case, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so, yeah, like Tim was saying, um, I worked, I started out at Capcom Japan um, in, in AAA, and I worked in games there, and then I went indie, and I've been indie for several years. Um, and I have been doing production, for the most part, production work. Um, so that's kind of my area of expertise. So I am going to talk to you about some production methodologies and stuff that you would generally encounter in the course of game development. And then once we get through a bit of that and you've got a bit of a background, um, I'm going to walk you through kind of how. So the production strategies start to diverge once you get into AAA and Indie, because they are very different beasts. Um, so, without further ado, um, so who am I? I've kind of already been over it real quick. Um, I started out as a Fulbright Fellow in Japan, uh, doing economics, as researching the influence of cultural preferences on sales in video games. Um, then I was a production manager at Capcom, so I handled things like art outsourcing, so like building pipelines um, to work with external partners so that they would make art and deliver it to us and we'd use it in games. Um, business development uh, and international production coordination. So I used to do a lot of work with Capcom Vancouver on the Dead Rising series. Um, and yeah. So a bunch of stuff like that. And then I've been an indie developer for four years. City of the Shroud is the first game that we as a team have made. Um, I've worked on a couple others, um, one of which did make it to release. You find that happens a lot in indie. Um, and then, yeah, and then while I was at Capcom, I worked on Deep Down, which did not ever come out, unfortunately. Um, Dead Rising 3, a couple other Dead Rising games. Um, Steel Battalion Heavy Armor, Dragon's Dogma, and a few others. Um, so production is cool because you get to touch a lot of projects usually. Um, your skills are valuable sort of across the board um, and it doesn't always take all of your time so it is possible to sort of get onto multiple projects and see lots of different things um, from a number of different angles. So it's a pretty cool field to be in, and not one that gets talked about very much at the beginner level, like the like getting into games level, um, because it's a lot more common and I think probably fun to talk about programming and art and audio. Um, and you'll see why here on the next slide. This is what production looks like. <laughs> it's flowcharts. Um, you have tasks that get broken down across disciplines and then how they and then you have to figure out how they connect to each other and how things flow into each other and who needs to know what and in what order. Um, and then your job is then to pull all of that together and make sure everything gets done on time and on budget. So it's it's complicated and it's ambiguous, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, you end up wearing a lot of different hats, so you end up, most, more often than not, you're managing a team of people to get things done. Uh, the size of that team will vary based on the project. Um, if you're the producer for an entire game, you're going to be overseeing a team of producers who are overseeing lower level producers. It's kind of nuts. Um, then if you're on the lower end of it, you're going to, your job is going to be keeping aspects of the project on track um, or higher up all aspects of the project on track. And occasionally that turns into business stuff like contracts, um, finding companies to work with, negotiating with them, 
and even in some cases figuring out how the game is going to make money. Um, sometimes that means making the business plan. I've worked on a couple of games where the producers were in charge of coming up with a DLC. Um, you know, it's a it's a job that seems fairly well defined and really, really isn't. Um, the farther along you get down the chain towards indie, the more you start doing things like QA and minor coding. Um, it is it is a very uh, very broad area to work in. Um, ultimately, though, you're working with people, so communication skills are key. Um, you're going to be talking to people who might be running behind, and they need to know what they need to do to catch up. Or you might have a situation where the programmers need more of the memory budget in order to make some system that they want to work work but the art team can't afford to surrender any more memory without sacrificing visual quality and then suddenly you're stuck in the middle of negotiating between two teams who both want something very very much um, your ability to navigate those situations is part of the skill set that um, the that people want when they look to hire a producer um, but ultimately, the job is get the game done and get it done on time and on budget. Um, that usually means applying some form of project management. Um, I have covered some of the uh, project management styles that no one uses in this area and this area because no one uses them because they're not a good fit. Um, but in development, you're dealing with something that's always changing and hard to predict, and so you need to be able to think on your feet and adapt very quickly. Um, so the better suited to that style of development uh, methodology is, the more likely people are to use it, which is why Scrum and Agile are probably the two most common industry approaches. Um, they're very similar, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's kind of boring. <laughs> um, but Suffice to say, Scrum is essentially you take like a chunk of the game and you say, okay, in two weeks, we're all going to do some amount of work. And then you do those two weeks, and at the end, throughout the process, you're talking to each other and seeing how you're doing. And at the end, you look and say, okay, how well did we do? Did we make the deadline? Did what is what we made good? What do we need to fix? And you sort of iterate, think about what you're working on as you work towards the end of the project. Um, Agile is pretty similar. You're basically, instead of breaking it into like time, you're breaking it more into like iterable tasks. Um, you're still working on a schedule, but it's a little bit more about iteration and responding to changing needs than it is about like, okay, how much can we get done in this amount of time? Um, computer are going to be super useful at the indie level because there's a lot of overhead that goes into them, and indie is pretty freeform, so generally the simpler the better. Um, which is why Kanban is also popular. Kanban is basically just post-it notes. Um, you have a to-do list, a doing list, and a done list, and that's it. Um, you can make it more complicated and break it out by discipline or whatever, but ultimately you're just saying, right, what are all of the things we need to do? What are we working on right now? And what's already done? Um, and so for indie teams especially, that's really helpful because you basically just look at the board and you go, oh, okay, this is what we're working on. Or, I've finished everything that I was doing, now I need to grab something out of the to-do pile. Um, last but not least is Waterfall, which is basically, it came from construction. So it's like, we are going to do this phase, and we're going to do this phase, and then we're going to do the last phase. Um, and if anything goes wrong in that process, it basically causes lots of knock-on and delays because people are stuck waiting for things to get done on other teams. Um, it's not super popular anymore. Um, there was a time when people used it for everything, but now it's sort of fallen by the wayside because um, it's just, it's very easy in games for things to go wrong. So having something where the moment something goes wrong, the rest of the team is delayed is generally not a good strategy. Um, ultimately though, any method works. Um, there's been research done on which of these has the best outcome. And the results were, as long as you use a method, it doesn't matter what method you use. Um, just don't do nothing. If you do nothing, it will be chaos and it will be terrible. But if you do anything to keep track of what's going on, 
it will help you get the project done, uh, which is ultimately what you really want. Um, so really, you just want to start simple and then add complexity as required. Um, but you know, just very briefly, I want to show you kind of some of the tools of the trade. This is Trello. You've never seen Trello. This is what it looks like. Yeah. Um, it's a to-do list. Um, this is what ours looked like at one point. I just broke out the doing into like categories. So there's like the art team is working on something, the game programmers are working on something, and so on. Um, and there's a big old to-do list. And it's handy because you can give it color like coding and assign people and have like discussions and checklists and due dates and all sorts of stuff. It's very handy, it's very quick, and it's really easy to use. Um, so real fast, I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Like this is Trello. So you know, you do things like this is my done list. This is, this is where I have put make Trello board, and I was working on the presentation today, so it was underdoing. Now I am done. That's literally how easy it is. That's it. That's game production 101. You have passed the course. Um, you can do things, jump in here, assign yourself, um, move it to doing, because that's what we're doing right now, and you're like, oh good, I'm almost done with the project. Um, I mean, that's really it, but if you start out making a game, game and there are a few of you who want to do something, I highly recommend just giving this a shot. It's free, it's super easy to use, and it keeps everybody on track. Um, it's, I mean, I've made two games with it now. Like, there's no reason not to give it a try. Um, the alternative is Hack and Plan, which is a little more fleshed out. Hack and Plan does a lot of stuff on the back end for you as well. So like it automatically comes with all the different um, categories of game development, like audio and art, and programming and bugs. Um, so you can just sort of filter into those you need. You can do things like assign and then compare that to how long it actually took. And then sort of breaking the information down for you to tell you whether you're on track, finish on time or not. It is super helpful. It's probably what I'm going to use moving forward. Um, it's, it's a little, little bit more complicated than Trello because it requires a little bit more uh, input from, from the user, user but the, the information, information it gives back to you is really, really good. Um, so, so if you're doing a game or something, start with Trello, and then if you decide to do something a little more ambitious, just in front of it, and maybe get back and a shot. Um, other stuff, which is for you on. Um, you probably already know this, but like the handiest thing is there are going to be file sharing, sharing tools like the Google Drive or Dropbox, Google Spreadsheets or Excel or sharing with this is Excel and checklists. Um, when you're working with other people and you have uh, like the technical requirements, one of the things you can get in one of the time and checklists is being like, does this pass all of these simple tasks? And as long as it does, it will work in the game. Um, that's a lot of things. Then you want to sort of version management. Um, so Git is an option, Perforce is an option, Unity you Collaborate is an option if you use Unity. Um, Unity Collaborate is the easiest, it has the few features, but it's dead simple. Um, Git is probably the most robust, but it's also the easiest to mess up and it's scary to serve on technical people to use. So if you have a team, if you have team members who are not technical, Git can become quite a headache. Um, Perforce is somewhere in the middle. It used to be a lot worse, and then they were complaining so much that Perforce made itself not as terrible. Um, but it just seems like they sort of look around, pick and choose what works for you. But um, definitely do these things. There's nothing worse than having uh, like just today, I was working on a scene in Unity, and my computer locked up and crashed, and it wiped out the entire scene. Um, completely corrupted it, not usable whatsoever, no idea. Um, because I was using Collaborate, I clicked two buttons and it stored itself. So, do this. <laughs> so, anyway, that was a really rapid fire introduction to production and some of its techniques. Um, the stuff that I want to go over now is how that varies once you get it in AAA and um, So you can sort of 
see get a sense of what the two sides of the industry are like, um, also sort of from a production standpoint, what you deal with when you get into those roles. Um, so obviously we're looking at these two images, it is plain to see that running the world of the Warcraft team and TC2 Tech versus Brendan Money and Chain, they have very different requirements. One is several hundred people and one is four people. Um, there's, there's a lot of the changes to that. Um, in general, in AAA, specifically in production, you have a lot of responsibility because you're just trying to get things done. Um, you're dealing with large machines, with tons of moving parts, with budgets that are massive, and then the deadline is tight and you can't miss like Marketing starts years in advance. Um, like the reserving a slot at being stuck on the physical banners can happen like two years in advance. And if you get to three months before the game's out and you go to the head of the project and say, we're going to have to cut that critical feature because it's not good enough, like, you will not be allowed to cut that critical feature. You will have to find a solution. Um, so it's, it's, it has a lot of tension. It's a lot of fun. But there's a lot riding on you, uh, so you have a lot of responsibility. In any there, like obviously, if like you're doing this for a living, you are responsible at that point for making sure that your product is out the door so that you can continue to live. Um, there's not really a higher level of responsibility than that. But at the same time, if it's a small number of people, you know, you're, there's a lot less riding on your shoulders in terms of communication and awareness and what have you. Um, so, generally, what we were looking at is sort of an approach that varies based on the person. Um, Valve's uh, employee handbook leaked, quote unquote, leaked uh, several years ago, um, and they talked in it about having a look for T shaped employees. Um, and a T shaped employee is someone who has sort of a broad understanding of several fields, but one very, very strong understanding of a specific field. Um, so you can drop them into the situation and they'll sort of be aware of all the stuff that's around them and be able to parse it, but at the same time they'll be able to really commit in the field that they specialize in. Um, when you're in AAA, that or even an I shaped person who's just an expert can be really useful because you have lots of people working on a team. Um, and so it doesn't really matter if everybody can't do everything because there's usually someone to do some, that something. Um, and because it's a triple A, that person is usually going to be very good at that one thing. Um, in the, you end up with more of a generalist approach because you have to do everything yourself. You might be mainly a programmer, but you might have to fiddle around with um, 3D modeling and animation software because who else is going to do it? Um, so sometimes you end up losing the ability to specialize as much as you an incredibly broad knowledge base. Um, so generally what we're looking at is that in AAA, you have roles that you need specific people to fill, um, and they're looking for that role to be filled, not necessarily a specific individual. And in indie, you're usually taking what you can get. So the people who are on the team are going to sort of influence the type of game you're making, which determines the kind of roles that you're going to need. Um, so everybody's a generalist, everybody can sort of do a little bit of everything, which might allow you to specialize a bit. And if one person is generalist and another is a real expert at one thing, you can maybe plan um, to work around that and say, OK, we'll do this one thing really well, and the other person will sort of cover all the other bases very lightly. Um, and what does that look like? Um, if you've ever played Pokemon, then one of these charts will be familiar to you. Um, so trick play, you're trying to do this. You're trying to be really, really good. It's not the best at everything. If you're in, you're trying to do this. Be as good as you can at one or two things. Um, and so, especially from a production standpoint, you need to be able to look at that and go, okay, what's achievable and how do we achieve it? And in AAA, where you're dealing with these massive, complicated projects, 
Um, you're learning how to bring them together, and you're working with these extremely talented, focused people, and you're working to keep them on schedule, um, but you're also having to solve problems in ways that will fit the goal of hitting all of these points like optimally. So that usually means solving things with money. Um, you usually have a budget where if everything's on fire and you need to save the game, um, oftentimes you'll be able to find an extra budget and hire someone to come in or work with an outside company to come in and help you save the game. Um, and that's just sort of, you're more likely to be able to do that than you are to be able to cut content or somehow speed up production without using time or money as a resource because it's basically impossible. Um, but the, the juggling act that goes into that is really, really, really complicated. But if you're in that role, you learn a lot because you are seeing these massive machines that are generating these incredibly complicated structures um, in action and working in part of that. Um, whereas in the um, you're usually working on a little less complicated stuff with resources and more limited. So you're sort of like a rag tag team, you're going through issues, um, and you're kind of having to look at things all over the time, because you usually don't have any money to fix it. So you're looking at either spending money or taking the game and fighting content. And then you as a producer have to look at that and go, all right, right, how much longer do you think it's going to take? How much content do you think? Do I think we're going to have to cut to make this work? Um, the more information you have on that, the better that you have to succeed in the project. Um, the more accurate you're going to be, the better you're going to be able to judge what sort of compromises they make. Um, so, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, if you're thinking about going into community development as a career, um, you really want to think about which one is right for you. So, like, first off, if you even think about which one, think about do I plan on using it? Because that is a very important distinction. Um, it can be uh, disheartening to get into the game industry and realize that you don't like any of them. Um, because at that point, you see how the sauce is made and it sort of spoils part of the fun. But like if you wake up and you're like, I've got all these ideas, I want to try making them and then bring them to the bring them to reality, then like it's an awesome deal to work in. Um, and the next thing, once you start doing your work, once you get that part out, is how much influence you want over the final results. Um, if you are working to control A, um, your role is very important, but the level of like visible personal impact that you have on the final product is very limited. Um, you know, you're, you're very much more uh, a piece of the puzzle rather than sort of the person in making the puzzle. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so, if your own creative expression is, if your desire to express yourself is a lot stronger than your desire to just make cool games, um, then you need to be on your choice. So, if you like working with lots of teams just to make cool, exciting projects happen, um, Triple A can be really good for that. Um, and then and last, uh, how much risk, risk are you going to take? Indie is super risky, and I'm going to try to reveal that in the next couple of slides. But um, you know, if you're if you're working for yourself, you don't have health insurance, you don't have a good paycheck. It can be really, really scary if something goes wrong, and um, you, you have, have to be able to look at that. that. You want to look, look at that at any time. Is this something that is this is a risk that I'm um, and you see a lot in the game development circle of sort of people promoting the theory about promoting the reality of it. So, you know, it's something that I was trying to take a little time to touch on. But ultimately, AAA, you're working on these leading edge high profile titles that match as much as you have very little influence over the final result. But your responsibility levels are still high. It is limited to that sort of teaching, high shape, expert, specific action betting. Whereas there's need to have full control of everything that goes right or wrong is on the new team. Um, and no other resources are free, but maybe it's free. 
which is a little sort of frustrating because you have these amazing ideas that are just possible to achieve. At the same time, if you figure out a way to make that work, which is part of that, I think, production skills, if you were to read the whole thing. Um, just before I wrap this up, um, I want to make sure I like, take a moment and like, just so you know, um, companies do hire roles, not people specifically. And so you see it happen a lot, uh, larger numbers of staff will be able to really like put in the projects. Um, so you know, I think it can be very, very risky. Triple A is not necessarily super safe either. Um, so just sort of be aware of that and you know, sort of read really into it if you decide to go in the industry and get a sense of what it's actually like. Um, there's plenty of stuff on the industry that talks about this. Um, the jobs themselves are also really hard to get. Um, they're kind of hard to get for them. People want other jobs. Um, and I know the farmers can be pretty steep, so Triple A is going to be one of the jobs. Fairly hard to get. That's it. Don't let that stop you from applying. Um, and there's a really but like, here's my optimal, but they're not necessarily going to be there right now if they don't get all of that. So be confident and then give it a shot. Um, and then and also, also just uh, because this is the truth, pay for college is in less than in different industries. And like you said, if you're a programmer, um, generally, if you're working in games, you're going to get paid like half of what you would for working on like a bank security software. That's it's probably because you're working, working on games and not uh, bad security software, but you know, yeah, it's, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then in the, the, the average the month is still less than 500 copies, and the solution to that is not make a good game because there are lots of different games in that under 500 category. Um, the solution is uh, almost as important to have a good timing. Um, you need to have good timing. You need to have a great idea, a ton of polish. Um, the people that the love what you're doing, Steam needs to decide it's going to push your game in front of people. There's a lot that has to go right in order for any to work out financially. Um, and part of the way to like, help mitigate that is to take as many shots as possible. Like, release as many games as quickly as you can, so don't take too long on them because you never know which one is going to be the one that sells really well. Um, and then be prepared to do a lot yourself. Like, it's hard to be an inky person who's an idea person um, because somebody's going to have to build it, someone's going to have to make the art, someone's going to have to make the sound, and very often that is just going to be the person you thought of it to begin with. Um, so just like, if you want to try out any development, just be prepared to do a lot of self-teaching. Um, so, in the end, um, in general, here's sort of my advice. Um, stay away from the for-profit game design colleges. This is sort of swirling around in the industry right now, but um, they're not necessarily your friend. Um, and they don't have very good success rates in reality, despite what they tell you in their statistics. Um, anyway, that out of the way, um, I recommend trying to look for an industry job if you can to gain experience. It doesn't have to be AAA, it can be a small mobile studio or whatever, but it's a good way to learn the ropes, kind of see what the quality thresholds are for professional products, see how people who are experienced in the field are making games and how they approach the tasks. Um, and the other approach would be to just start releasing small games on Steam or Itch. Um, just sort of mix it and put it back there and see how people react. Um, there's really no better way to kind of learn where you are as a developer and also sort of what um, what the process is like and what the audience is like and whatnot, just by doing it. Um, and because of the structure of the market right now, you can go out and do that, right? You can do that at any point. Um, there's nothing stopping you. So it's a cool way to sort of get out there and try it. Um, Put your health and economic stability first. Don't dive into any and double mortgage your house and work 80 hours a week until you release the game because, again, the average game sells less than 500 copies and no one cares that you double mortgage your house and work 80 hours a week. Um, so just like take care of yourself. Um, and then be realistic about what comes with working in the industry in general. Um, don't spend too long on your game unless you're a hobbyist, in which case just do whatever you want. <laughs> um, if you're working on games on the weekend just because you love making games, more power to you. That's a cool way to do it. Um, and again, 
Iggy is really, really hard. It's very cool, but it's really, really hard. This guy's math is actually wrong, because um, he's saying 10 bucks, 500 copies. That doesn't count taxes or Steam's 30% cut. Um, so your actual budget is more like $3,000. So that's like less than a month of work uh, to make a full product. <laughs> um, so yeah, like he says, if you could figure out how to do that, you win. The thing is that's basically impossible. <laughs> um, so bear that in mind. But Indy is very cool. You do get to do a lot of stuff and a lot of things. Just be realistic about it. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about Indy AAA production methods, whatever. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right, so yeah, thank you for going through that. There you go. Anyone have any questions? Uh, I've got some. I've got some. I'm not formulated any yet, so give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, can, you, can you hear me from, from here? Uh, I should be able to. Okay. All right. First question. Um, can you like talk about a, a particularly difficult task or project that you worked on in AAA, and then compare it to maybe a really difficult task that you worked on while working in D? Yeah, okay, so the hardest thing I ever worked on in AAA was the, I was, the localization uh, like quality manager for Steel Battalion Heavy Armor. So the game was almost out the door, um, and I got brought on at the last minute to oversee the, like, check it for the localization and make sure that it was okay. Um, and then it turned out that the game had more localization bugs in it than any game in the history of the company by a factor of five. Uh, the game was supposed to come out in a month and a half. Or it was going up for submission to Microsoft and Sony. Or no, to Microsoft. It's connecting. Um, and yeah, and so we were just like, what are we going to do? Um, and I was dealing, like, we found um, a localization company that could, like, hire enough freelancers to get everything translated um, super fast and like, fix all of the issues. And they were in Europe, and so I was staying up until midnight to like, receive files, and then I would send those over to From Software, and then From Software would work to like three in the morning implementing them. We had to bring the original uh, script writer back on board to like check the entire game in three days. Um, it was absolute chaos, and it was just nightmarish for months. Uh, but we got it out, and we got it out, and there were no localization bugs. And even though the reviews of the game itself were pretty bad, um, everyone who reviewed was like, oh, it's a shame, because the story is pretty good, which is about the best you can do with localization. Um, when compared to that, um, working on indie, it, there's like, there's like two kinds of problem I find. There's the the game show is tomorrow and the build is broken. What are we gonna do? Um, that one is very stressful, and you know you're on a deadline and you're just full of panicking. Um, if you're good at production, you have a backup build ready to go. <laughs> um, so that was sort of. We had that a couple of times, but we had an old build, and so we throw up the old build and then be working on it under the under the table uh, while people are playing through and be hearing bugs and being like, uh, uh, uh. So then we would, you know, finish it and get it out there. But it was quite literally, you know, us hunkering down and spending time that we should not have been spending on getting it done. Um, and the other side of that is just finding the time and the money to make it happen, which is a lot more like slow burn kind of difficulty. Um, so it's a fun city which crowd, I did a lot of production work uh, or a lot of contract work. 
Um, and so I, I translated, uh, I'm, I do freelance translation on the side. That's my dog. Um, so I do a lot of freelance translation on the side. Um, and part of that was the Legend of Zelda encyclopedia that came out this past June. Um, and, you know, that book is like 400 something pages. Um, and I was working on it full time while moving countries while working on the game. Um, and it was just overwhelming the amount of work. Yeah, I, I, saw that, I saw that encyclopedia at the Books a Million the other day. It was fairly impressive. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it's very, very heavy. <laughs> like, you would draw a cat with it? What? You would draw a cat with it heavy? I can't hear you through the mic, sorry. Like, heavy enough that you could kill a small animal with it. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> it had, uh, every monster, every item, every dungeon, every character, uh, that has ever appeared in a Zelda game with like ample text description about all of them. Oh, wow! With his it it was as long as I think three novels. I, I think it was about three novels long. Um, and I think we did the project. I was the only translator, and I did it. <laughs> I think I did it in three months. Wow. Like just under three months. Like it was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you know that, that's sort of the, that's a good uh, example. Triple A is like all of these moving parts, and everybody is scrambling to get things done, and you're hiring companies to come in and fix the problem. And in indie, you're sort of like, I have to do this, and you just find a way to make it work. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. So. Also, Thomas, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. You mentioned you didn't work at Capcom. Uh, any good memories or like anything that you really remember from there? Like any interesting stories? Stories from what? Sorry. Sorry, from when you were like working at Capcom? Oh, just general stories while working there? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so, so when I got there, it was kind of at the... It was right after um, Keiji Inafune left, who was sort of the, the guy who was in charge of Mega Man stuff um, for like ever. And he ran R&D and went on to make Com Comcept um, and Mighty Number no. 9. Um, and he had just left. And so the company was sort of, you know, trying to find a new head of R&D and we were sort of figuring out what to do. Um, but as a result of that, Part of it was that like we didn't make Mega Man games for a really long time, um, yeah. and I like I'm a huge fan of it. I'm like a really big fan of Mega Man. I've got the this like super limited promo Mega Buster thing <laughs> that you can't get outside of Japan. Just sitting on my desk. Um, and so I was, the whole time I was there, I was like, oh, I really want to make a Mega Man game and blah, blah, blah. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to. But um, the day that I left, I had just, you have to send out, if you leave, you have to send out an email to the entire company saying, you know, thank you very much for letting me work with you. It was, it was really nice getting to work with everyone. Thank you very much. Um, so I sent out this email, and in it I was like, you know, I grew up, and the first game I ever played was Mega Man X. Um, and uh, the guy who did all the concept art for Mega Man X 8, which at that point was like 10, more than 10 years prior, um, calls up to the team that I'm on, gets the secretary, and is like, has Keaton left yet? And uh, the woman who answered the phone was like, no, he's still here. And he was like, don't let him leave. Um, and she's like, she hangs up. She's like, hey, you're not allowed to leave. Right. Um, so I stay there for a while. And then uh, she, like, I get this, she, um, she gets this email and forwards it over to me. And he had, like, sat down and in the, like, 30 minutes that I've been waiting, had drawn his first piece of Mega Man X concept art that he had done in like 10 years as 
thank you. So he like drew the he like drew the character and signed the image and sent it over as like a thank you gift. Um, yeah, so like that was that was the kind of place that it was to work at. And I think that's a good summary of what that place is like. Could you could you show us that image? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd have to dig through my phone, so it'd probably take too long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I was in the pen. All right, so I've, I've got one or two. Um, when you say uh, being a tea expert or being some, or when uh, AAA is looking for an uh, expert in a specific field, are you talking like on the level of someone like John Carmack or John Romero, like of the old days, of, like being extreme visionary, or is it a lower level than that? I think it's not quite that dramatic um, because you know there are only so many John Carmacks in the world. It's more on the level of like um, you know, oh, we're looking for a gameplay programmer, and then are you looking for an AI like an AI lead, or are you looking for a junior gameplay programmer? Um, so like, if you are a large studio, and you're like, oh, we need um, we need someone to come in and take over for like the head AI person. They're gonna look for someone who is really skilled at writing AI, um, and that's gonna be an I or a T shaped person. Um, and if they're looking for someone on like a more junior level, but they're like, we want to put them on the AI team, they're going to be looking for someone who you know has experience doing AI and has like projects that they can show, um, but aren't necessarily like that level of master. Um, so it's sort of like, if you think of it in terms of roles, like if someone, you know, they, there's, they will, they might post a job saying like, we are looking for a junior gameplay programmer. Um, and in some cases that means like, oh, we're looking for someone who's just starting out and can kind of sort of handle whatever we throw at them. Um, but they might also, at the back of their minds, know that they're gonna put that person on the like physics team. And they're gonna be like, oh, I hope that person has like a strong skill set in physics. Um, usually they would mention something like that in the job posting, but you know, you you don't always know. Um, like when I got hired initially, it was because I was like, I had like a very unique set of skills going into the job. Um, and so they were looking for that sort of like T-shaped person who could, they could just drop into a scenario and be like, you already know the ropes and you already know the like, you have the skills that we need. Um, and if they had tried to take someone who was like sort of general and didn't really have the, like a, a background suited to the role, it would have taken a lot more time and they would have been less interested in bringing me on board. Um, so like another way to frame it then is like how much time are they gonna have to spend educating the person that they hire um, to do the job that they wanna do. Okay. All right, so one thing I'm wondering, since uh, you put together a team, how did you choose everyone that was on that team? Um, so I knew pretty much everybody that we worked with. Uh, this was very much a case of like, hey friend who is a writer, do you want to write the game? And hey friend who is a programmer, do you want to do programming? Um, sort of like finding people I knew who had the skill sets and wanted to make a game together. Uh, and then just sort of like bringing them on board and then having everybody you know, together, we thought of the idea of what the game is going to be and how things are going to work, and then sort of giving everybody, you know, this is what you're responsible for, and this is what you're responsible for, and then um, just sort of from my end, that is just making sure everybody gets that stuff done. Um, and yeah, it that's often how a lot of indie projects start is like you just find some people who all want to make something. Um, it helps if you know each other. Um, but it also helps more if you can work well together. Um, so, like, uh, I did Train Jam uh, this past March, and uh, I ended up on a team with two people I knew, one of whom I'd worked with before, one I hadn't, and someone I had never met before, um, but knew one of the other people on the team. And all of us were able to work together really well because our styles sort of fit. Um, and we all sort of agreed on what we wanted to make. Um, and 
had we, you know, there's a documentary that Vice put together on that train jam, and they interview a couple of people who like start out working together really well, but then they like break up over ideas about what the game should be, and yeah, you know, there's there's a million things that can go wrong, but for the most part, it's sort of like like-minded individuals at that moment are like, yeah, let's make a thing. Downside is keeping that together and getting that all of your releases like is very very challenging. Um, so anything you can do to give yourself an advantage, like do that. Okay, cool. Which, I just got yeah. that. I'm on more question for you. Uh, keep going around. Corey, you got questions? Yeah. Uh, I had a question about uh, relocating and like how much of that came out of your pocket as opposed to the company that you were moving to work for. Generally, from my understanding, most companies won't cover the cost of relocation. Um, that it's kind of a, I find it to be sort of a sore spot in the industry because uh, um, I know that a lot of what can happen in the large company space is uh, a company will hire a bunch of people on contract for two years and then let them all go once the game is released. But in order to get them to work on the game, they brought them all to a city somewhere. Uh, and then they've all been let go, and then a new game project comes up, and that same pool of people applies to go work this other studio, but that other studio across the country, and then you have to pay to move there yourself again. Um, and I've met a few people who have dropped out of the industry because that kept happening to them. Um, if you're fortunate, I think that's also partly why a lot of the studios are so clustered in specific hubs, because they can then just sort of share the same labor pool. Um, but yeah, it's it's rare for a company to cover the cost of, of moving out there. Cool. Right, we got anyone else who hasn't asked a question? Chris. So how do you get a team who have different ideas to somehow get together to form one, like go with one idea? Like mm -hmm. let's say like Jim wants to play Mars, like make Hearthstone but Kyle wants to make Call of Duty. How do you get those two to compromise and go on? Yeah, so on some level, I think you have to just be prepared to walk away. Because uh, it's not always going to work out. But um, usually it's just compromise and discussion and trying to find something that everyone can be excited about. So if one person wants to make Hearthstone and another wants to make Call of Duty, but they're like vehemently opposed to the other person's, I, like the Call of Duty person's like, I don't want to make Hearthstone, then it may be worth looking at like, okay, what else could we do? Or what can we do that sort of like fuses those in like a weird, uh, um, interesting way. If they're out there, like, you know, maybe maybe you take you look at action RPGs that use collectible card game mechanics in their combat, and then see about making a first-person shooter that does that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot you can do, but on some level, like, it's not going to work every single time. But if you just sort of talk it out, hopefully you can find something, even if it's not what you originally wanted to do. Okay. Right. We got any other questions? Okay. All right. Uh, Ray, yeah. Let's see. Someone has a second question. You got a little more time for that? Yeah. Excellent. I see a question here in the right front. No, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, actually, I want to ask, like, uh, any particular favorite project that you've worked on? Like, like, just in general, like, any projects that you have, like, fun memories of working on, or just, like, stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, so Dead Rising um, was, I wasn't super involved in the actual development of the game. We were sort of, the Japan side was more or less the publisher at that point. Um, so we had a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion, but there wasn't a lot of like, hey, I think the game should be like this. Um, but uh, we would fly out there for work about three times a year, three, four times a year. Um, and my, my wife, 
who was studying in Canada at the time was in the town next to where Camp Con Vancouver is. Um, and so I would ask the producer if I could stay an extra day in Vancouver and she would come over and we would um, get to spend time together because we were long distance Japan and Canada for five years. Um, and so with Dead Rising, like I was, I was on that for two, two and a half years. And so it sort of like gave us the ability to see each other a lot more frequently than we would otherwise. Um, and because everyone at work was really cool, um, like I would bring Jillian to like work events um, and they would make sure to like invite her to parties. And um, I would, you know, introduce her to all the people I work with. And so we all sort of like got to hang out a lot um, and got to meet each other. And like everybody I worked with on the Japan side knew who she was. And so when she would come to Japan and like see her waiting outside the building, and they'd like send me messages over the internal company network and be like, hey, I think your girlfriend's outside. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it was just, that was really fun. Um, you know, it was something that I don't, it was an opportunity that I don't think many people would get and I was really lucky to have. Um, and like I had a really understanding team and worked with a lot of really cool people who let me get away with doing that. Um, and not every company is going to be okay with you being like, hey, do you mind if my like partner tags along for this like work party? Um, and so, yeah, that was just sort of, that was something I was always really grateful for. Um, and I always like really appreciated that Capcom gave me the opportunity to do. Yeah, Isaac has another question. So uh, I've got another one uh, for you. When you recommend saying like getting an industry job to like start getting experience and stuff, what kind of scale are you talking about there? Because industry can mean the whole spectrum really in this kind of case. Yeah. I, know, I guess um, my real question there is how far down on the scale like size could you go before you consider that like before, before you would consider that good experience? I would say if it requires what your degree is in to do, um, or like it's in the, that level. So, you know, if you are doing a, a CS degree or an art degree, um, like I would not recommend trying to get into the industry through QA testing. Um, generally, like QA testing is not a great path. Um, it's very rare nowadays for people to get anywhere with it because it's low pay, kind of abusive in terms of labor practices, um, and all of it is outsourced. So it's like a company hires, like a publisher will hire company X who's like way out in the middle of nowhere, and they hire all these tests for time work, and then at the end of something, they just let them go. So it's very hard to like get into the industry through that because you have very little direct contact with people actually making this stuff. Um, but you know, the, another option is to, like, if you don't see anything that you can apply for right away, another option is to just show up, not to the company, but to the industry events. So, like, GDC, Train Jam, um, stuff where you will meet people and work with people who are in the industry. Because um, for better or worse, the industry is kind of um, and it's hard to get into, but then once you're in it, you're in it. Um, and people sort of look out for each other and try and make sure that if someone loses a job or needs to move somewhere, that they'll find new work wherever they're trying to go or whatever. Um, and so like, it's a good, it's good practice to sort of like in places where you're going to meet people. Um, and then just sort of keep an eye out for jobs and even freelance work um, that is going to utilize your skill set. Because if you work on an indie game um, and you're proud of the results and it sells 10 copies, but it's up on Steam, um, the next time you go to work on a project, you can point and be like, I worked on this game. And they'll be like, oh, you've released a game. They don't care that it sold 10 copies. And now that Steam Spy is gone, they'll never know. Um, <laughs> But you know that's that's something else you can do, um, and so like you know if you're if you're going to be working on your degree for a while and getting into games is something you're really wanting to do, 
going to GDC and doing train jam, but also like doing game jams and putting stuff up on itch and maybe even going big and trying to get something up on Steam. Um, that's you know it's it's worth giving it a shot um, because when someone is looking to hire, if you have a portfolio that you can show them that says I know what I'm doing um, and is not just sort of like class projects, um, then that can be really powerful. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, Got another question? So would you? Um, like, would you say what would be a better way to like start out in the industry? Should you aim small or aim big? Um, aim for what's available. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, sometimes you'll get lucky. Like, I got really lucky. I was very, very fortunate to get the job that I did. Um, but I, you know, it was a long and winding road. Um, but you know, if. Uh, you know, if you are looking to get experience and say there's a company in your area that, you know, like say there's like a 40 person mobile studio and they're hiring for a junior programmer or like a junior artist um, or like a sound designer or whatever, um, you know, that's also worth applying for because you will get experience um, making games and working in tech and doing the exact same stuff that you would be doing on God of War or The Last of Us or whatever. Um, it's just different context. Um, and so, you know, if you can if you can jump straight into AAA work, that's awesome. Um, but if you find work that is more local or not as glamorous but still in the field, like that's cool too. Um, most people in the industry aren't necessarily working at those huge companies, so like. There's nothing wrong with starting out and saying like, okay, well, this year it looks like these two companies that are really big are hiring, and then they're all these like mid-tier companies that are also hiring. There's nothing wrong with going and applying just all of them and seeing if any of it works out. Um, on some level, it's that like once you're in, you're in. So like, if it's what you really want to do, or you want to find out if it's what you really want to do, just go for what's available. Um, and then of course, like be realistic about the industry and the company and like don't get too carried away by the dream. Like do, because it's cool, but also like just be realistic and make sure that like whatever you're applying for would in fact work for you. Any other questions? I have a question. Sure. My question is, how many games you've worked on in total indie-wise, and of the games that you've worked on, how many of them have not made it to uh, release? Indie games, huh? Um, I have worked on five indie games, I think, if you count, and three of them are available. Um, one of them went into early access, and that was when I stopped working on it. Um, and it didn't change much between early access and full release. Uh, and then another one was much smaller, and we released it for free. Uh, and then City of the Shroud is by far the biggest. Um, and that one we released it about two months ago. Um, and the other two never made it past the pre-production phase, so like testing to see and like find the core game loop and the like building the initial technology. Um, it's usually okay. No, actually six. <laughs> I missed one, but yeah. It, usually, if a project is gonna die, it's gonna die. Um, it's gonna die from lack of desire or interest or something um, or ability to finish it in the pre-production phase where it's just getting off the ground and then occasionally they'll die in the like production phase usually because they run out of money or time or something and then rarely um, they'll die in the like we're almost done phase and if that happens it's, it's usually something catastrophic has changed and there's just no way to make it work. Um, but that's pretty rare. I've only seen that happen like one time. Uh, 
basically the one of the core team members was like, I don't want to do this, and just left. Um, and that was the end. Uh, I have a question just about uh, portfolios in general, right? Uh, see, I don't know if you can see this from the top of the area. Yeah. Uh, my question is, would it be better to just have a portfolio of one or two projects that are really good, or would it be better to have a portfolio that is maybe six things one or two of which is excellent, and then three or four are still pretty good. And if you have any tips on portfolio building, I would love to hear them, if you don't hear them. Yeah, um, so, yeah, I, it's a tough one, because um, it is partially determined by volume. So if you have like two excellent pieces and three pretty good pieces, Lead with the excellent ones, but also include the pretty good ones. Okay. Um, and you know, you can do things like include the like amount of time that went into making the um, that went into making the piece. So if you're like, oh, I, um, you know, this this piece that was pretty good took me, you know, X number of hours. And then the excellent piece only took a few extra hours compared to that. Then maybe you're in a situation where someone will look at it and be like, "Oh, okay. So if this person just spends a little extra time, they can really deliver. Um, just give that little extra bit of information." Um, but generally, yeah, if you've got a lot of work, you can just showcase like your best work, and then maybe somewhere have access to the stuff that you don't think is quite as appealing. Um, but yeah, like part of it is just volume. Like if I went to someone's website and they were like, check out my portfolio and it had two pieces of art on it, I would be like, mm, I don't know what this person is capable of because there are only two pieces of artwork here. But if there was like, you know, if it was divided up and it was like, like, concept art at, or like marketing art or something and it was like two really excellent pieces and then like concept design beneath that and like four or five that were pretty good but like gave the idea and the information you would need from that type of art then you can look at it and be like okay yeah so this person is really good with the like marketing art and if i need them to do the concept art that like a 3d modeler could then turn into assets for the game or whatever um, so it's sort of a mix of like showing your skill and also like the stuff that you can do in terms of like different categories. Um, unless you're a specialist, in which case just show off as much of your special your specialization as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have any other questions? I was just wondering if we can get that PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> can we get that PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, um, I'll send it over with the email later. Cool. And uh, one last thing. So, if anyone wants to ask anything else or get in touch with you, is there a way to do that? Or you? Whether it's mm -hmm. Twitter or email or what have you? Yeah, um, so if anybody wants to uh, ask further questions, um, my email is fine. Just feel free to share it. Um, and then otherwise, um, Twitter is also a good uh, way to get a hold of me. Um, I don't think if I type it, it will show up on your screen. So uh, uh, we can get that shared in our Discord channel. OK, yeah, just share it there. That's the other place. Um, email or Twitter will reach me. So. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this talk and answering our questions. Yeah. No worries. Yeah.